Our next session is fossil-based energy systems. Uh, we're a little bit behind on time, so we're going to go straight into the, uh, to the talks. Uh, we've got three really interesting uh, talks, one about ionic liquids, which is really important in terms of uh, making materials that can do very good separations, very efficient separations uh, in terms of CO2. Uh, we have a talk that will fold economics as well as technology into it, which is a critical piece, because if it's not economic, uh, it's never going to happen. Um, and then we have a, a talk which is kind of special in terms of the combination of coal to electricity and generating hydrogen in a separated fashion altogether, um, which is sort of a special thing since uh, coal is this vast resource that's very hard to use. And hydrogen is something which is carbon free, but it's pretty hard to make without having carbon show up uh, in some other place. So we have some neat opportunities in terms of the programs, but uh, other than that, I'm not going to say more. Um, so if Edward could head up, we'll get going uh, on this. Um, our first speaker is uh, Edward Magan from uh, Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Notre Dame. He joined the faculty in Notre Dame in 95 and currently holds the Dorini Family Chair of Energy Studies. Uh, he's also the chair of the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. Uh, Edward. Uh, thanks very much. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here uh, to tell you about some of the work that our group has been doing on um, looking at ionic liquids for uh, CO2 capture and separations. And so I'm here to report the results of our, of our team. I show you a picture here of some of the faculty and students involved in this effort. And um, I think we don't need to uh, explain why CO2 capture is important. I think yesterday's sessions really made this abundantly clear that um, we have to think about carbon capture if we're, if we're going to be able to uh, meet some of the sustainability and CO2 targets that we all need. And the typical way that people think about this is in terms of um, thinking about coal. And certainly CO2 capture is important for coal. Coal is a huge uh, uh, available resource. There's a lot of uh, coal reserves and installed base uh, of coal-fired power plants. And we know that fossil fuels contribute or make up about 85% of our, of our base energy load. But I'd like you to think about CO2 capture in, in other aspects as well. Um, we know about shale gas is also now becoming um, uh, a very important element for our energy mix. And although natural gas has a lot less uh, carbon intensity than coal does, we still have carbon emissions. So we replace uh, gas-fired uh, power generation for, for the dirty old coal-fired power generation, but we still produce CO2. And so you can think about needing to do capture of CO2 from these situations. Um, the flue gas and effluent is a little bit different from coal-fired power plants. Um, and then I, I really like Thomas's talk yesterday. I borrowed his uh, image of this uh, about the, um, the reduction of CO2 to make fuels or to make chemicals. And the obvious question here is, where is this CO2 going to come from? You're going to have to do a separation if you want to be able to do CO2 reduction as well. And uh, the other thing to think about is, uh, if you want to do CO2 reduction catalytically, how are you going to get the CO2 into solution? And I want to show you some work on ionic liquids that may be a, a, a very good uh, liquid solvent that can uh, generate very high concentrations of CO2 to be used in catalysis. And then lastly, we heard yesterday about negative CO2 emissions, this notion of being able to use biomass and then uh, in the uh, production of energy from biomass to still capture the CO2 in order to have a, a net negative CO2 emission. So in all of these cases, we're talking about having to separate CO2 from some effluent stream. And they have very different conditions, very different temperatures and pressures. So what we need is a very versatile platform on which to be able to think about doing CO2 separations. Now, we just heard um, in the previous uh, talk, Professor Val talking about uh, the, the um, typical way of doing this is with uh, a means. And you can think about, really, um, post and pre-combustion as two examples uh, at different ends of the spectrum of, of our CO2 uh, capture uh, problem. In the top slide there, you, you can see that what we have is a, kind of a typical post-combustion scenario where you take some carbon source and combust this in air. That generates a, a flue gas that's comprised of, of uh, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, water, and some other things. And we need to do the separation to remove the CO2 from that. It's important to recognize that the flue gas there is at relatively low temperatures and pressures, maybe 40 to 50 degrees C, maybe about one bar. And the partial pressure of CO2 is, is actually about a tenth of a bar. This becomes a pretty challenging separation to conduct. Moreover, if you want to do sequestration, you have to raise that pressure of CO2 up to 
about 150 bar in order to, to, uh, to sequester this. So that's part of the energy cost of this whole carbon capture process. On the other hand, if you think about something like a, a gasification or a pre-combustion application, here we gasify the carbon. It could be from biomass. It can be from coal. Uh, we, we can then do a water gas shift reaction. And then the primary uh, system that we have to do a separation on is a high temperature and high pressure mixture of mostly CO2 and hydrogen. So now we're up to maybe 200 degrees C, 60 bar. It's a very different type of separation that we have to do from, from the uh, post-combustion um, aspect. So, uh, and there's really a range of different separations we could think about if you do combustion of natural gas, very different conditions there. So what we'd like to have is a platform that can allow us to think about doing these type of uh, CO2 separations for a range of things. Um, we, we favor using solvent-based methods. Um, this is a simple little uh, movie kind of showing how this works. If you have a flue gas containing CO2 and say nitrogen or maybe hydrogen, you'd like to bring it into contact with a solvent, shown here as these yellow molecules, that preferentially will associate with the CO2. The other gas is left to either process or you can vent to the atmosphere. And then the complex uh, solvent, which carries the CO2 with it, is then regenerated with some trigger. It could be heat. It could be other things like uh, uh, a photo effect or something. Um, then you can recycle the solvent and you've done the separation. So this is the, the basic idea behind a liquid-based uh, separation of a gas. And this is um, a very well-established technology. This is one of the reasons why we like liquids. Um, gas processing with liquid contactors is, is well known in chemical engineering. Um, the trick here is we need a solvent that can operate under these different conditions that we require. So some of those uh, properties that we need are a high selectivity and affinity for the carbon dioxide. We'd like for these things to be what I would call tunable. That means uh, they need to be amenable for use in either the, the pre or post combustion. Very different temperature, pressure conditions can separate CO2 from either hydrogen or from nitrogen. Um, and so we want to have uh, the ability to kind of adjust the, the properties of the solvent to meet these different needs. Obviously, you want this to be a, a thermally stable uh, solvent because we want to be able to uh, regenerate this and, uh, and have a long lifetime. It can't be a, a one-shot uh, type of a solvent. And especially in a pre-combustion application where the temperatures are high, we, we need to have very low volatility. Um, if, if, you have to, if you're losing this continuously to evaporation or if you have to add extra processing to recover your solvent because it's volatile, this is really a, a, a very expensive proposition. So in the end, um, what our goal here is, is to try to optimize solvent properties in order to minimize the regeneration costs. We don't want to have to pay a huge energy penalty in order to recycle the solvent. But we also want to minimize the liquid flow rates so that the, the size of the equipment is smaller to reduce capital costs. Uh, and that's a kind of often in tension uh, between the regeneration energy and the capital costs. So as has been mentioned, the conventional technology for doing CO2 uh, capture right now is aqueous amines. Just giving you an example of one type of an amine, a monoethanol amine or MEA. Uh, the idea here is that at low temperature, you contact MEA, which is dissolved in water. Uh, it's about 70% water. And it takes two MEA molecules to react with each CO2 molecule, forming a, a carbamate and an ammonium species. Further, you can react with water to form bicarbonate. This reaction can be reversed by heating this up, and you can recover the CO2 again. So this, this is proven technology. It's been around for a very long time, and it works, but it has several drawbacks that really limit its application in the type of uh, systems that we are, uh, would like to apply it to. For one, the means are volatile. They smell very bad. If you think about putting these in a power plant, you're going to have to have extra processing to capture the means because you don't want to admit these to, uh, admit these to, the, to the atmosphere. I mean, you're also thinking about air pollution problems of you know, taking CO2 out of the air and releasing amines into the atmosphere. That's not a very good uh, trade-off. They, they tend to be very corrosive, so materials of construction are important. And uh, probably the biggest problem with amines is that uh, because you have all this water you're carrying around and having to uh, vaporize during the regeneration process, they have a very large energy penalty, upwards of 25, sometimes estimates are even 30% of the, of the, of the um, output power of the power plant is going to be um, used just to run the gas separation process. So the parasitic energy load of this is much higher than thermodynamics says should be, should be possible. And so our goal is really can we develop liquid solvents um, that can overcome some of these problems with conventional means. And so 
We've been for some years now working on a class of uh, liquids called ionic liquids, which have been around for about, uh, kind of known, this uh, type of ionic liquids has been known for about 20 years now. And they're just simply salts that are liquid uh, under ambient temperatures. So if you look at this picture up in the upper right, this is uh, one of our graduate students holding a little vial of an ionic liquid, and it's not uh, 800 degrees Celsius. You can hold it in your hand. But that's a pure salt. It's not dissolved in water. It's not dissolved in a solvent. It's 100% salt, but it happens to be liquid at room temperature. And um, there's a huge chemical diversity of compounds that can be made into ionic liquids, which really makes them intriguing platforms for thinking about uh, gas separations. Because they're salts, they have a very high cohesive energy density. They're essentially non-volatile liquids. You can put this under a ultra-high vacuum and it'll just sit there and won't do anything. You can see here, this picture here, this is uh, an image of an ionic liquid with CO2 dissolved in it where we're pulling a vacuum. The CO2 just bubbles out of the liquid and the liquid stays behind. So the removal of CO2 from the ionic liquid is trivial, um, and that makes them very attractive. They tend to be non-corrosive. We don't have to use water. We can use these in an anhydrous manner, so we don't have to carry around the excess water baggage. And uh, this plot here shows that they actually have uh, an intrinsically uh, high physical selectivity and solubility for CO2. This is a plot from my colleague Joan Brennicke's experimental work showing you uh, the mole fraction of, of the gas versus uh, pressure at one temperature. The red symbols are CO2, and you can see oxygen and nitrogen are down here with very, very low solubilities. So already you have a solvent that, this is sort of a stock uh, pyridinium-based bistrifilamid, which has a very high selectivity for CO2. The other thing that's important, and I'll come to this in a bit, is we can uh, design these to, to even chemically react with CO2 to get even higher selectivities. So our approach in the GSEP project has been to follow this, uh, what we call model-guided discovery. And Ed Rubin, I think the next speaker is going to talk a little bit about how you do process modeling to try to understand the economics of CO2 capture. We think it's very important to start with process modeling, understand the nature of the process, and what are the properties of your solvent that are most important that are driving the costs. Um, Mark Stott here at Notre Dame is doing some of that work for us. And then he tells the, the computational group here, um, here are some of the properties that we need out of our ionic liquid. Things like capacities, things, uh, binding energies, heat capacities, those kind of things. And my group and Bill Schneider's group uh, then try to predict with atomistic simulations what particular molecules should have those favorable properties. Brandon Ashfield in chemistry will then make those molecules, and Joan Brennicke has the capability to measure the thermodynamic properties, gas separations, and all the different properties as well. And then through an iterative process, we try to optimize these things so that we're not just kind of randomly synthesizing molecules and throwing them into the lab, but we have some intelligent design involved in, uh, um, I guess intelligent design is the, um, that's not the word I was looking for. Um, we have a, a, a good idea of what we're trying to make here. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the computational methods that we, uh, that we use. Um, we like to be able to predict isotherms of CO2 and other gases in the ionic liquid from first principles. And to do that, we use atomistic Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, the basic idea here is we have a liquid phase shown here in the upper left, coupled thermodynamically, although not physically, to a gas phase. And we use a series of stochastic Monte Carlo moves to satisfy the phase equilibrium condition. And we can do that for a given set of temperatures and pressures, and then we get a, a single point on an isotherm. Typically, that means we have to simulate hundreds of these ionic liquid molecules in four to five nanometer periodic systems. These are now fairly standard kind of calculations that you can do uh, a matter of uh, days to get a full isotherm. So we can start from drawing a molecule on the computer to getting an isotherm in really less time than it takes to synthesize and measure it experimentally. And we can do this in parallel fashion on uh, lots and lots of these at one time. So we now have a capability of doing rapid screening of, of ionic liquids for um, their th uptake properties. And this just gives you an example of some of the things we can do. I'm showing you here uh, two different ionic liquids. On the left is something called butyl methyl imidazolium bistrifilamid. The cation here is a butyl methyl imidazolium. On the right is a very similar ionic liquid. It's just that there's a hexyl chain instead of a butyl chain. These two were chosen because there's an awful lot of experimental data on CO2 uptake in these ionic liquids, and we wanted to benchmark our calculations against that. So here we're plotting pressure as a function of mole fraction of CO2 at different temperatures. And there's a lot of information on here. Uh, bottom line here is that uh, the simulations are quantitatively capturing the experimental isotherms 
And we're not fitting to the experiments. These are purely predictive calculations. One of the most important quantities for us to get right is the enthalpy of absorption. And uh, for physically dissolving CO2, that ends up being between 12 and 16 kilojoules per mole experimentally, and the simulations are able to capture that quantitatively. Um, we can also do hydrogen. So if you're thinking about pre-combustion applications, we'd like to understand hydrogen solubility as well. Hydrogen is much less soluble in the ionic liquid than CO2. Um, here there's also less experimental data. It's a very hard measurement to make, but there is some. And so again, for the same two ionic liquids I showed on the previous slide, you can see different isotherms. And the simulations here are now at different temperatures. Um, interestingly enough, these lines correspond to different experimental sets of data. There are four, three of which agree with uh, one another and one which doesn't, one which predicts hydrogen is much more soluble. Our simulations agree with the other three uh, sets of experimental data. So in some sense, the simulations are helping us provide a check on the consistency of literature data that maybe doesn't always agree with, with uh, each other. The other thing that's interesting to me anyway is that uh, the calculated and experimental enthalpy of absorption is actually positive for hydrogen in an ionic liquid. If you think about a free energy argument, that means that entropy is what's really responsible for the solubility of hydrogen in, that, in the ionic liquid. And this is typical of very low solubility gases. Uh, what that means is that unlike CO2, if you heat the liquid up, the solubility actually increases. And we're able to capture that positive enthalpy in our simulations, and it's been observed also in the experiments. So what you'd really like to do now is be able to do the selectivity calculation. Uh, we don't want to just think about pure CO2 or pure hydrogen. So we've done that, and this table has a lot of numbers. I don't expect for you to, to look at these uh, and see that. I just would like to point out one thing about this is for these two different ionic liquids, uh, the selectivities that we compute are on the order of, say, 45 to 50 for CO2 over um, nitrogen. And this is based on just physical dissolution of um, the CO2 and nitrogen into the ionic liquid. We can calculate an ideal selectivity by just fitting the, the pure isotherms to a, a simple model and, and assuming that these things don't interact with each other. And that actually gives us very good agreement with our computed selectivities. An important thing to point out, however, is that if I just made the approximation, which is often done in the literature, the experimental literature, that the ratio of the Henry's law constants gives me the selectivity, I would greatly overestimate the selectivity. You would estimate that it's on the order of 70, when in fact the selectivity is more like 50. And um, this is really, I think, one of the benefits of these models is that you can test these type of predictions because mixture experiments are, are much more difficult to conduct than the pure gas experiments. And so we didn't really have good information about this. Um, so let me move on and talk a little bit about increasing the capacity of the uh, ionic liquid for CO2. These physical solvents I've been talking about previously are very good uh, if you have high pressures and low temperatures. But in cases where that's not the, the situation, um, the capacity of these liquids is going to be too low. So you'd like to add reactive groups in order to increase the capacity. And I just show you here a, a, an experimental plot, again, of mole fraction of CO2 versus pressure for a physically dissolving ionic liquid. This is the one I was showing you on the previous slides. And what you can see here is that you have to go up to very high pressures, 10 bar, to get a mole fraction of about 0.3 uh, for CO2. But that's occurring at 10 degrees C. As the temperature increases, that uh, capacity drops dramatically. And if you're operating around uh, a tenth of a bar, like you might in a post-combustion capture application, you really aren't dissolving any CO2 at all. So you need to add uh, chemical reactivity to increase the capacity. And the obvious question is, how strong should you bind? If you bind very strongly, you're going to have to pay a larger energy price to remove the CO2 and regenerate the solvent. So we'd like to try to maximize the capacity. Um, calculations done by Bill Schneider has helped us figure out how to do this. Um, what he did is he, he looked at the relative free energies, uh, reaction energies, for CO2 binding on a conventional monoethanol amine. And he based this as a zero energy reference state. So what he did is he added CO2 to MEA and the first CO2 um, bound, and uh, he called that a zero reference energy. And then he went ahead and did the deprotonation reaction to form the carbamate and the ammonium species and calculated that energy and set that as a reference. So what we call this first step when you can halt the uh, binding of CO2 after the first case is a one-to-one -one binding, one amine for one CO2. The two-to-one binding, though, involves a deprotonation reaction, and it takes two amines for one CO2. And we know that this is the, the mechanism that's operational for MEA. 
So then Bill did a calculation where he added an amine group onto a cation of an ionic liquid, a pyridinium, and he found that relative to MEA, the first binding event is slightly uphill, and the second binding event is very negative, minus 71 kilojoules per mole for the deprotonation. So the prediction is that if you put an amine group on a cation, you'll see the same two to one binding that you see with the conventional aqueous amines. Surprisingly, however, um, if you put the reactive group on the anion, in this case, an amino acetate anion, uh, it's downhill for the first binding event, but then it's a big uphill, 71 kilojoules per mole, to do the deprotonation reaction. So you can arrest the reaction here at this first step if you put the reactive group on the anion. And this basically doubles the capacity uh, of CO2 in the ionic liquid if you put the reactive group on the anion and not the cation. And this is unique to ionic liquids, and so that's what we've done. We've also built a little model that's a, a very simple si uh, single-site Langmuir-type model that says, all right, we're going to bind a CO2, one CO2 to one anion. Um, if you can compute basically the free energy, you can calculate the equilibrium constant, you can get the, the isotherm, basic thermodynamics. We uh, estimate the free energy by just calculating the translational entropy of CO2 in the gas phase and saying that that's what delta S is for this reaction. And then we compute the bond strength delta H. So for different delta H's, you can get different characteristic isotherms. Here is what the model would predict for 50 kilojoules per mole binding. At low temperature, you get almost one-to-one -one binding. And then as you raise the temperature, uh, the binding decreases. So the idea here would be you could uh, capture CO2 at low temperature and low pressure and desorb CO2 at high pressure and high temperature. And that would be the delta there is the capacity of your solvent. So we've shown that this works. You can uh, add reactive groups onto anions. Here's uh, two different amino acid-based anions. And the experiments show that we do get this one-to-one -one binding. Uh, and the, the uptake isotherms are really consistent with the first principles predictions. And we've confirmed the mechanism here with calorimetry and vibrational spectroscopy. And we think we understand the chemistry of these systems really well. So this really led us to develop this kind of class of ionic liquids having aprotic heterocyclic anions. These are examples, perolide, imidazolide, and pyrazolide, that can do this one-to-one -one binding. And we can tune the binding strength by changing the R group functionality uh, along the uh, ring. So here's an example. If you take something like a perolide, there's a reactive group here at this nitrogen center. And if you just have basic perolide, CO2 will react and bind quite strongly, 110 kilojoules per mole. This is the, the prediction. You can add electron withdrawing groups around the ring. So in this case, a cyano group at the three position, the binding goes down to minus 70. If you put a little bit closer to the nitrogen group, now at the two position, you're down to about minus 50 kilojoules per mole. And so uh, our process simulations tell us that minus 50 kilojoules per mole is a sweet spot for some of the applications. So we went ahead and made this two cyanoperolide system. And sure enough, experimentally, we see exactly what we would have predicted from the models. We see this kind of Langmuir type isotherm. So this is now experimental data. And then as you go raise the temperature, the, uh, the capacity goes down. Experimentally, we're about minus 43 kilojoules per mole. So the, the calculations predicted minus 49. This is pretty reasonable agreement with the experiments. And I didn't talk much about this, but um, we can also show that the viscosity of these things doesn't change when you react with CO2, which is different from amines. The viscosity of amines goes up considerably when you dissolve them in CO2. So over the course of this project, we've made a whole bunch of these different ionic liquids. Um, and here are all experimental isotherms for a bunch of different anions with one particular phosphonium cation. And so you can see from indazolide, which has the highest binding of minus 54, we get very rapid saturation at low pressures. Whereas if you go down to 124 uh, triazolide or 123 triazolide, these have lower binding energies of, say, minus 37, minus 40, and the isotherms are much flatter here. Um, so we can kind of dial in the uh, binding energy depending on what we want based on these kind of calculations. Now, um, I should tell you that maybe the simulations aren't perfect. Um, what we found was that we're not able to quantitatively predict all of the isotherms uh, perfectly well. We're using a very simple model. We have a, a gas phase anion, and we're just calculating the delta H of reaction uh, of a CO2 reacting in the gas phase. Um, what we observed uh, experimentally is some different isotherms here for um, four different ionic liquids. And the, the observation is that the, um, this is a pyrazolide anion, should bind the strongest, followed by this uh, two cyanoperolide, and then a 124 triazolide. And 123 triazolide should not bind very strongly at all. 
Um, unfortunately, the calculations didn't catch that trend. We did see that the pyrazolide should be the strongest binder, but we missed the fact that 1,2,3-triazolide uh, doesn't bind as strongly as the other ones. So in this case, our simple model was breaking down, and what we realized we had to do was add more reality into the model. So what we did is we did um, uh, first principles ab initio molecular dynamic simulation of the cation-anion pair in the gas phase. So this is uh, showing that the anion interacts very strongly with the cation, as you might imagine. And this has a profound effect on the reaction chemistry. And I won't go into the details of this other than to kind of cut to the chase and show you uh, the result here. Um, here's an example of uh, one, this would be one, uh, three, four um, triazolide with a CO2 bound to it interacting with um, a particular cation. And what you can see here is that the, the bond length here between the CO2 and the anion uh, depends upon the interactions that the anion is having with the cation. And this, in turn, affects the, uh, the binding energy. The plots on the left show you different distributions during the course of the simulation of the distance between the CO2 molecule and the anion and the anion and the cation. And what you can see is it's very dynamic, and the energetics change because of the interactions between the anion and the cation. If we put that added realism into the model, what we can find is that uh, we do get the proper order of the adsorption now by um, using this ion pair model. So this gives us a better um, uh, uh, result. Um, just real quickly now, um, we also have been able to uh, try to simulate um, the, the reaction in the, in the formal condensed phase, not just an ion pair in the gas phase. And Quinton Sheridan has a poster 30 last night where he showed how this works. We can construct a thermodynamic cycle, basically, and calculate solvation-free energies uh, uh, in coupling that with the gas phase free energies to get condensed phase uh, free energies. The last thing I'll mention is that um, we're working on coming up with cooperative binding uh, models where we can uh, get beyond the sort of Langmuir model. The Langmuir model is nice, except uh, you, you have a sort of delta pressure or delta temperature that sets your given capacity. What nature has done uh, is in, use cooperative binding, for example, in hemoglobin, where you can get sigmoidal type uh, isotherms. So you have multiple binding where the first binding event uh, makes the second binding event more favorable. That leads to this sigmoidal type uh, isotherm, and now you need much smaller either pressure differences or temperature differences to get a given capacity. So we've made a whole bunch of different ionic liquids with two to one uptakes that we hope will have this type of cooperative binding event. And very recently, we me measured some of the isotherms for these, and for this particular system, we do start to see upwards of two uh, molecules of CO2 binding for each ionic liquid, and evidence uh, although uh, not quite perfect, of some sigmoidal shape in this isotherm. So we're pretty excited about that. So um, just to quickly summarize, we've designed ionic liquids that have uh, both high CO2 capacity and can be tuned over a wide range of energies uh, to make them suitable for a, a different types of uh, CO2 separations. Um, and what we're working on are, are improving the computational methods that can help us uh, choose other ionic liquids and looking at cooperative binding events. So uh, finally, I just want to acknowledge, uh, very grateful for the support of GSET that's allowed our team to come together. Uh, and here's some pictures of my uh, co-PIs. Brandon Ashfeld did all the synthesis. Joan Brennicke did the thermodynamic property measurement. Uh, Bill Schneider, the quantum chemical calculations, and Mark Stout here, the process modeling. And thanks very much for this opportunity to present our work. OK, we have about uh, three minutes for questions. So what's the stability of the ionic liquids in the presence of water, and especially water at high temperatures, and then also SOX and NOx? Great question. So for water, um, some of the ionic liquids we, we find will, will um, reprotonate. The anions will reprotonate in the presence of water. Um, the ones that I was showing you here don't do that. The cyanoperolide in particular, the one um, where we've done most of our work, we've done very extensive tests with water. In fact, all of them are stable in the presence of water. The problem is the presence of water and CO2 uh, because the acidic environment is, is, can, can deactivate them. So the, the answer is some are stable, some are not stable, and, and uh, we're trying to understand that. Sox and NOx will react with the reactive amines and uh, very hard to get them back off uh, once they react. So in any kind of an application, if you have a lot of sulfur, you'd have to have a desulfurization step before you would want to do the CO2 capture. That's, that's kind of our current thinking on that. What kind of pressures are necessary to uh, get the CO2 to desorb? So um, 
typical, if you look at the isotherms that we have there, um, we want to we want to desorb them at as high a pressure as possible because then we have to take this up to pipeline pressures. We can um, desorb these things at around 140 degrees C. The ionic liquids are still stable, and uh, the pressures then are a few bar at that point, and you can get good capacity. Uh, we don't want to go to vacuum at all. The the economics of vacuum for these systems is is not good. So. Uh, we want to absorb them at uh, always above atmospheric pressure and desorb them at higher pressures and just use temperature as the driver. But in principle, you could use vacuum and do this at lower temperatures. It just turns out that for this particular system, it looks like the economics are better if you use higher temperatures and higher pressures. That's assuming, of course, that you have to compress the CO2 back up to pipeline pressures. Okay, one last quick one. I've heard that uh, ionic liquids are very difficult to manufacture and worth more than their weight in gold. Um, so do you envision that these uh, may have some of those same uh, cost uh, uh, challenges? Yeah, that's always an issue with, um, you know, these are new molecules, many of them have never been made before. So they are worth their weight in gold when Brandon is making, you know, milligram quantities of them with this very talented uh, graduate student. Um, the idea though is that these are not particularly exotic materials, they're carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, um, and so that if you were to make these on scale, the cost will go down. I'll tell you that Petronas, uh, the Malaysian uh, oil company, has just installed a process where they're doing mercury removal with ionic liquids, and they're using um, ton quantities of ionic liquids in that process. Uh, the ionic liquids have been stable for a couple of years, and uh, so there are examples of large-scale industrial uses of ionic liquids, and, and really what you need is you need those kind of applications where you can make these on scale to get the cost of the liquid down. But we're very cognizant of that when we're designing these things. We're, we're trying to avoid any kind of exotic materials that will really drive the cost up. Great. Thanks again, Edward. <laughs> okay, we're gonna move on to our second person named Edward. You do realize this is an all Edward session, right? My last name is Edwards. We had Edward, we have Ed Rubin. We're just gonna keep going. And Turgut is Turkish for Edward. So when we get to Turgut. Uh, over there. Um, so our next speaker is, uh, is Ed Rubin. Go ahead, uh, Ed. Um, Ed is with Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon, and he was the founding director of the University Center for Energy and Environmental Studies um, and the Environmental Institute. Uh, in addition to his uh, very active research agenda, uh, his activities include roles as the coordinating lean author for the IPCC Special Report on Carbon Dioxide Capture and Storage, advisor to the State of California and uh, Province of Alberta on policies for CCS, board member of the UK Research Center, and an author of the recent National Academy Studies on America Climate Choices. Sorry? Cut that out and add it to my time. Add it to his time. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am uh, uh, really uh, representing uh, these, uh, these folks. These are the colleagues back at Carnegie Mellon who've done all the heavy lifting uh, on this uh, project. And uh, the work I'll be presenting is uh, due mostly, uh, mostly to them. Um, so very briefly, uh, it looks like all of us are starting talks with uh, why the interest in carbon capture. The professor and me can't help that, assuming that some of you have come here without too much background in this. I'll talk a little bit about the objectives and scope of our GSEP project, uh, some progress uh, uh, to date, and, uh, and some of the work ahead. <clears throat> so why the interest in carbon capture, uh, in addition to uh, Ed's comments and others, again, the fundamental motivation is climate change <clears throat> and the fact that we need not small reductions but large reductions in CO2 emissions uh, in order to achieve those goals. If we were talking about 5 or 10 percent reductions to solve the climate problem, we would probably not be talking about CCS. 70, 50, 80 percent is a different story. Fundamentally, CCS is the only technology available <clears throat> that we know of uh, that can address carbon emissions from the existing use of fossil fuels, which <clears throat> are likely to be around for, for some time. So my, my view of it is, it, uh, is more of a, a bridging technology, something that uh, will uh, be necessary if we want to get large carbon reductions uh, fairly quickly while we're working on a long-term uh, sustainable future. Uh, CCS also turns out to be a major component uh, in all the modeling studies that are done uh, globally 
when one looks at cost-effective strategies to meet climate change, every modeling group uh, who's looked at this uh, shows that without CCS on the table, the cost of achieving climate goals will be substantially higher than without. Trillions of dollars uh, are typically estimates that, that come out of that. So uh, while the focus of this talk is on CO2 capture, we, we shouldn't forget that it's really part of a capture and storage or sequestration system that has three major components. <clears throat> uh, first, the, uh, the ability to capture CO2 from power plants and other industrial sources that produce it. Uh, again, the CO2 might arise from coal combustion, but it might also arise from natural gas combustion or the use of biomass, <clears throat> so-called negative emissions. Uh, in order to sequester or store it in a geologic formation, which looks like the most likely uh, uh, option right now, uh, one has to compress and transport it. Uh, and so the compression is typically needed to turn it into a, a supercritical fluid, essentially a liquid uh, that can be moved by a pipeline to uh, uh, appropriate storage uh, sites. Um, we're going to be talking about two major approaches. <clears throat> what we can do today, we've talked about and Ed set this up beautifully, post-combustion and, and pre-combustion. Here's a little more detailed schematic of what a post-combustion system would look like at a, uh, a coal-fired power plant today. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this is what most of the utilities look like without the CO2 capture piece. Uh, so the yellow box in the middle are a variety of uh, technologies to address so-called uh, criteria or conventional air pollutants, SOx, NOx, particulates, <clears throat> mercury. Um, and if one were to capture CO2 in a post-combustion environment, one would add uh, another piece of technology after that <clears throat> upstream of the stack. And uh, as Ed uh, indicated, the current technology that would, would do that job uh, is an amine-based system. We have CO2 at uh, low concentrations and low pressure. So this is a chemical uh, solvent, <clears throat> and uh, its energy uh, requirements are, uh, are substantial. Uh, the pre-combustion system um, looks a little more complex. The CO2 capture piece here actually has two components. <clears throat> uh, there's a CO2 capture unit uh, toward the back here, which today would use a physical solvent. So here we have high pressures and relatively high concentrations of CO2. So rather than a chemical uh, solvent, one can use a physical sorbent uh, to, uh, to do that job at a much lower energy cost. <clears throat> But in order for that to work, one first needs to add upstream a water gas shift reactor that basically uh, is a, a chemical process that converts CO in, in the gas to CO2 and H2. So uh, the CO2 capture unit is basically trying to work on a, on a, uh, a, hydro, at a CO2 hydrogen mixture as opposed to the post-combustion, which is largely a CO2 nitrogen mixture at much lower pressures. Again, the chemical that would be used today <coughs> favorably is commercial called Slexol. It's a glycol-like substance that uh, uh, has been used widely in industrial applications. Um, here's what some of this actually looks like in terms of hardware. These technologies for both post-combustion and pre-combustion have been used um, at power plants, both gas and coal-fired power plants, the two on, on the left, at scales uh, roughly an order of magnitude smaller than a commercial plant today. So these units are in the order of a couple of tens of megawatt uh, electricity uh, uh, equivalent. Uh, hydrogen production uh, plants, or uh, this particular one uses a, uh, a Selexol system to essentially do the same separation, except the hydrogen is, uh, is used to make chemicals instead of, uh, instead of electricity. Uh, here are uh, photos of two newer uh, developments. Uh, the one on the top is, um, I would be fair to say, a big deal. Uh, this is the first uh, large-scale demonstration of post-combustion capture at a coal-fired power plant. It's what the community has been waiting at, uh, at least a decade uh, for. Uh, in uh, this, uh, uh, Canada won, uh, won the lottery on, on this one, the, uh, the Sask Power Boundary Dam facility at 110 megawatts. There was official inauguration on this uh, just two weeks ago. The plant started up a month ago. Uh, the CO2 capture unit is in the, let's see if I can get the, is this, uh, this unit in the foreground. Uh, so this is now operating at 90% uh, capture and uh, for the first month or so, uh, so far, uh, so good. 
Uh, <clears throat> the picture on the bottom is a unit still under construction uh, that is now scheduled to start next year rather than this year. It's a large uh, gasification plant <clears throat> that uh, the Southern Company is, is building. Um, and it will uh, capture uh, CO2 using uh, Selexol uh, as, a, as a solvent uh, at a scale of 600 megawatts with uh, <clears throat> about 65% capture. So we're starting to see in these uh, two examples and others that are planned in, uh, in Europe uh, <clears throat> the first large scale uh, uh, implementations of that. Uh, if that's the good news, this is the bad news. They're expensive technologies <clears throat> uh, to uh, one significant digit uh, in, in a new post-combustion plant, uh, adding uh, an amine system would increase the cost of generating electricity at that plant by roughly 70%. <clears throat> the incremental costs are lower for uh, gasification combined cycle and natural gas plants, but still quite significant. And uh, in terms of an absolute cost of electricity, uh, we're at different baselines. Uh, we're talking about CO2 capture in this meeting because most of that cost is associated with the capture part of that system. Transport and storage, well, those costs can vary depending on site specific. They're roughly on, on the order of 20%. So if you want to make a, <coughs> a big dent in uh, CCS costs, uh, you've got to go after the capture process. And there are lots of uh, uh, ideas for how to do that. Uh, this is a slide from the Department of Energy showing a, a variety of options that are being pursued in different scales. And, and some uh, notion of their time frames for, uh, for, for success. Uh, I was happy and delighted to see GSEP join that uh, process a couple of years ago. Uh, a uh, request for proposals uh, sought advanced carbon capture processes and consist consistent with the GSEP philosophy, uh, looking for, uh, and these uh, words step out, game-changing improvements, big improvements uh, that could have big impacts in, uh, in the next uh, uh, several decades. Uh, and as a result of that solicitation, uh, three projects were selected. Uh, Ed's project at uh, Notre Dame involving ionic liquids, uh, Randy's project at uh, Northwestern involving metal organic frameworks, and uh, Jen Wilcox's <coughs> project here at Stanford uh, involving uh, some uh, novel activated carbon solvents. Uh, so what am I doing up here? Uh, a year later, uh, there was another RFP asking for uh, development of a systems analysis framework to, to be able to evaluate uh, novel processes, these three in particular, but others in general, uh, in, uh, in the context of some uh, rather rigorous criteria that GSEP had put in the original proposal for what they'd like to see in these advanced uh, processes. Um, so uh, we were selected along with uh, Chris Edwards' group here at, at Stanford to to work on a uh, systems analysis framework that could be used to get some quantitative uh, metrics for just how these advanced systems would fare relative to uh, baseline systems in, in the context of full uh, power systems. Um, the approach we had uh, uh, proposed and, and have been following is to build on some prior work we've been doing with a lot of support from uh, the Department of Energy uh, with that support, we've built a, uh, uh, a modeling framework called uh, IECM is the acronym, if you Google it, Integrated Environmental Control Model. It's essentially a, uh, an easy to use uh, <clears throat> model of a single uh, power plant. It could be coal-fired, gas-fired, uh, biomass. And it basically uh, includes all of the environmental control systems, not only for air, but also for water, because water use is another uh, issue here in solid waste. So it's, it's basically a full-blown mass and energy balance uh, <clears throat> with uh, uh, engineering economic models and the ability to handle uh, uncertainty. We propose to build on this framework uh, as a tool that we and then others could use to uh, uh, ask and quickly answer a whole variety of what-if questions. What if I <clears throat> could create a material that had these characteristics and so on. So the overall approach is uh, basically to uh, couple uh, engineering process performance models with models of uh, uh, cost, engineering economic models in a, in a systems framework that uh, has a probabilistic capability so one can look at uncertainties in a, in a fairly rigorous way to identify both risks and, and opportunities uh, and hopefully in a package that, uh, again, is easy to use and uh, 
uh, and portable so others can, uh, can play with that. So the software package, if you were down to download it today, uh, is one that uh, has a graphical user interface behind which there's a lot of stuff uh, you bring to the model, uh, information on uh, the design of the power plant <coughs> uh, that you're uh, interested in, fuel properties, some cost factors, uh, <coughs> and the model delivers information on process performance, emissions, and, uh, and costs. Uh, so uh, when this project started, we had uh, in it already a whole suite of technologies, uh, <clears throat> a number of CO2 capture, baseline CO2 capture systems that we had worked on, some other things we're doing for DOE, and a whole, uh, whole suite of uh, power plant and environmental control technologies. Uh, and what we've been doing in this project is to work specifically with the three groups that GSEP has been funding uh, to develop new process performance and cost models uh, that could be uh, implemented in this framework and used uh, to assess some of the specific criteria that GSEP put in their original proposal. And these guys have, I think, the biggest challenge uh, ahead, of, ahead of them. Uh, GSEP enumerated eight criteria. I've reorganized them into four that basically deal with performance metrics and four more or less with cost metrics. Uh, <clears throat> I've highlighted three of them, the ability to capture and separate more than, more than or equal to 90% of, of, uh, of the CO2 uh, to substantially reduce the energy penalties relative to what they are now, uh, but also to keep the cost low. Uh, <coughs> so it's a, it's a perfect uh, GSEP challenge and uh, uh, along with a number of other things. So our job is to try to figure out um, uh, how things are going in these directions and uh, <coughs> probably more importantly to try to use a larger modeling framework uh, to suggest ways that uh, one can move more, more effectively toward, uh, toward meeting these goals. So let me tell you first about some of the work we're doing. Um, the three projects all have about a year left, uh, as does our project. So we're, we're about halfway through the project. So this is really a, I intended this to be a, a kind of an informal uh, progress report to uh, uh, GSEP and others. Uh, let me tell you first about what we've been doing in, uh, uh, in the area of post-combustion uh, capture. Uh, I should say, oh, I think one of the slides got, mm, I lost the slide here. Uh, I should back up and say first that all three groups that I mentioned are still working actively on their materials. So they have not given us the formula, <coughs> uh, the magic recipes yet for the materials they think will do the best job of that. Uh, somehow, either, Maybe it'll show up later, a slide seems to have been dropped. So what we've been doing is working with uh, what I've called surrogate materials, uh, <coughs> materials that are similar in nature to the, to the materials that the groups are doing, but they're not, uh, they're not the, the last word. So uh, one of those uh, in, uh, in uh, Jen Wilcox's project here at Stanford uh, is looking at, and we heard a little bit about this this morning as well, uh, some novel activated carbon uh, uh, sorbents. Uh, these are basically solid sorbents that uh, might do the job. So on the, uh, <clears throat> on the left, these data points are some data that Jen was kind enough to provide uh, to us. And the solid lines are uh, fits to that data using a uh, conventional Langmuir uh, equilibrium uh, model. Uh, that uh, does a, a nicer job down in the lower in the temperature ranges that uh, are likely to be, uh, be relevant. So uh, what we have basically is a model representation of, of, of that. Um, on the uh, uh, MOF uh, <coughs> side, uh, we have, uh, with advice from uh, <coughs> the folks at, uh, at Northwestern, we've looked at uh, a number of uh, <coughs> metal organic frameworks that they believe would be most uh, uh, useful to, uh, to start, uh, start playing with. The data I'll be showing you, so we've looked at a several MOFs, we've also looked at some other solid sorbents, not on uh, uh, either of those types. Uh, so I'll show you some preliminary results in a minute based on, uh, this is a, a, a zeolite, uh, we'll just call it ZIF-78, uh, isotherms of the sort that Ed just, sh just showed. Uh, so here is basically, uh, uh, CO2 uptake as a function of temperature and pressure. Uh, we'll look at a case study at 50 degrees Celsius, which is a typical flue gas temperature coming in, uh, using isotherms both for CO2 and, uh, and nitrogen, where you'll notice the scale is quite different. 
Um, <clears throat> We wanted to start uh, as simple as, as we could, uh, and so the first model that we have put together is a, um, a three-stage, a three-step uh, uh, process which involves adsorption and regeneration. It's a, it's a pressure swing uh, system uh, where uh, flue gas containing, in this case, idealized as, uh, as uh, CO2 and nitrogen uh, is uh, fed into an adsorber. Uh, and then uh, when breakthrough occurs, <coughs> the system's reversed, and there's a vacuum that pulls out the, uh, the CO2 to, uh, to give a, a CO2-rich uh, rich product. Uh, one of the things you can see in, uh, uh, in, uh, in this system, well, I think I have another slide here. I'm going to skip over the details. It's in there. Uh, here's a better representation. Uh, <coughs> let's look first at the one on, on the right, on the left, rather. Uh, these two lines, the blue line is showing CO2 recovery, which is basically the CO2 capture efficiency, uh, and the red line showing, <coughs> showing the purity of the CO2 that's captured. Uh, the GCEP target is 90% uh, capture, and uh, for this uh, uh, sorbent at this temperature, uh, the only way to do that is at very low pressures, probably unrealistically low, but those are the numbers that would come out for a single stage vacuum uh, separation. <clears throat> so 90% purity, low pressure, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, 90% recovery, and the, re the, the uh, purity levels are also uh, not, don't exceed about 70%. Uh, these two slides show specific work. This is um, <clears throat> uh, energy per unit mass of CO2 absorbed, and the sorbent required to do that, again, uh, we need to operate at low pressures is what comes out of the uh, uh, information here. So we've run a, uh, a preliminary case study <coughs> using our, uh, our IECM framework uh, where we assume 90% capture in a single stage VSA system. Uh, <coughs> we pressurize the adsorber to a little over atmospheric pressure, 1.2, uh, and desorb at this uh, very low uh, pressure, uh, but then compress the CO2 uh, to 135 bar, which is basically uh, pipeline, uh, pipeline pressures. Um, and here are some pr preliminary uh, results. Uh, let me just focus on this next to the last line, uh, which is the net power plant efficiency. <coughs> uh, basically, uh, there's a lot of energy needed not only to do the capture, but most, of this, most importantly, uh, to do the compression uh, if one actually had to go to these very, very uh, low vacuum pressures to, to do that. Uh, so the result in this case is a power plant, which would be 39% efficient without CO2 capture, uh, takes a significant hit comparable to what it would take with a conventional uh, amine system, <coughs> uh, and, uh, <coughs> but also with, with lower uh, purity, and uh, that would probably not be uh, uh, pure enough to put into a pipeline. So uh, the take-home message here is we need to go back and, uh, and build a more uh, complex model of, uh, of a uh, probably a two-stage process and, maybe, and play with some additional parameters uh, <clears throat> to achieve higher efficiencies and, uh, and higher product purity with, uh, with this system. Uh, this was uh, the best of the several uh, sorbents that we looked at, uh, and so other materials uh, would have similar challenges, I think, is the preliminary finding uh, that we come out of here. Um, we also modeled a pre-combustion system using ionic liquids. Again, we used a particular uh, liquid that was recommended to us by the, uh, the group at, uh, at Notre Dame. Uh, here, basically, we're comparing, a, <coughs> we're substituting ionic liquid for uh, a conventional Selexol solvent. Uh, the Technology, the process for doing that is the same uh, using either, uh, either uh, sorbent. Uh, so there's an absorber. This is syngas from the water gas shift reactor, so it's essentially uh, modeled as a CO2 hydrogen mixture. <clears throat> in this case, in both cases, we've taken impurities out of the system. Uh, <clears throat> and the adsorption is followed by a series of uh, depressurization steps <clears throat> Uh, in flash drums and recompression to basically desorb the, uh, uh, the CO2. Again, we use uh, data for that particular ionic liquid, which uh, Ed can probably pronounce and I can't. 
uh, <coughs> and uh, used it in a uh, preliminary case, uh, case study where, again, we're looking for 90% uh, CO2 capture uh, and uh, taking a, an entire system uh, compressed to 135 bar <coughs> with an idealized gas mixture of CO2 and, and hydrogen. Again, uh, there are details of the process model that I'll put in the, uh, in the presentation, uh, but here's the bottom line uh, in terms of the simulation of the overall power plant. <coughs> uh, this is the power just for the, uh, the unit I just showed you, and in this case, the ionic liquid actually uh, it turns out to be about 10% better in terms of energy requirements than, uh, uh, than, uh, than Selexol. Uh, not a huge breakthrough, but a step in the right direction, and we can, step, we, we, we can look forward to other properties. Uh, <coughs> Haibo Zhao, who did this work, also did some sensitivity analyses. We're starting to play around with this to look at uh, effects of, ver of various design parameters. Uh, and what we really need to do uh, CO2 removal efficiency, if one backed off the 90% target, moved down to, say, 85%, uh, actually some things actually start looking better. So there's a, there's a lot of playing around that remains to be, uh, remains to be done. Uh, I think in terms of preliminary uh, messages that come out of this uh, very early work, uh, we're just underscoring what uh, Ed and others have said, that work on <coughs> novel materials really has to focus on high selectivity uh, to uh, ensure high capture efficiency as well as high purity. Uh, these have all been uh, idealized simple systems, so we haven't mucked it up by putting any water vapor uh, into uh, either of these. <coughs> all of these materials are, uh, <coughs> none of these materials like water vapor, and so either you have to design one that is uh, impervious to it uh, or make the system more complex by taking a dehydration step, which is really not what you want to do. So in order to improve the realism of this, uh, we'll need additional data on uh, sorbent behavior in the presence of water and other impurities, and isotherms not for single component uh, gases, but for, for mixed uh, gases in order to get more, more realistic performance estimates. So none of those uh, imperfections were in those results I showed you earlier. Uh, let me just say a, a, a brief word about process cost models. Um, I'm not going to show you any cost results today. We're working on that, still a work in progress, but just in terms of what our, our approach is and some preliminary conclusions from some other work we finished recently on, on some other processes. Uh, what we try to do in our cost models <coughs> uh, are uh, first estimate on the capital cost side what are often called direct equip equipment costs. <coughs> what would it cost to... Uh, uh, buy and install the equipment that one needs to do the capture. What's often forgotten and often handled rather, I was going to say sloppily, that's not right, um, uh, with not as much care as, as, uh, as, as is perhaps needed, uh, are a lot of the indirect costs. So in a traditional cost estimate, after you do an equipment costing, <clears throat> there are a series of other measures, things particularly called uh, contingency costs, they're all typically estimated as a percentage <coughs> of your direct equipment costs. Uh, there are some guidelines for how that can be done. Uh, in some recent work, um, I've stuck my head out and pointed out that uh, major organizations who put out these guidelines, like DOE, EPRI, and, and others, uh, in many of their own studies, don't follow their own guidelines and tend to give numbers that are probably more optimistic than they should be for this stage of development. So we want to be careful in going forward. And the reason is that um, <clears throat> there's a lot of history that suggests that um, <clears throat> we tend to be optimistic technologically at the earliest stages of technology development. But as technologies mature toward FOAK is called first of a kind, <clears throat> a real commercial reality. Um, <clears throat> while ideally we all want to get to that low cost nth of a kind uh, plant, uh, you have to start uh, somewhere else, and you can't get to the nth of a kind plant without building n plants. Okay? If you never get past the first one, you'll never get to the nth of a kind plant. Um, so uh, what we have found, and I suspect we'll find in this case, is that high capital costs is another major barrier and hindrance to uh, the entry of new technologies. Uh, historically, there's a lot of data to show that we've done a poor job of predicting 
uh, uh, costs, commercial costs at early stages of development. Uh, so we're going to try to do a more careful uh, and more realistic job on that. But the message that comes from the work we've done uh, so far is that while uh, as engineers we're also we're, we're always after the holy grail of improved efficiency, um, there are trade-offs. <clears throat> uh, and so there are challenges not only to the technical community uh, in finding and tailoring uh, more appropriate materials, uh, but also to the engineering community at large in finding ways of minimizing the capital cost of, of these systems uh, <coughs> uh, and, and challenges in terms of how we can make things simpler, how we can reduce the size of vessels, how we can use materials that are cheap and not expensive. Uh, those two uh, sets of challenges, I think, are the ones I will uh, 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 want to emphasize here and the fact that there are inevitably going to be trade-offs uh, between cost and performance in terms of getting to that next best system. So a lot of the work ahead, uh, <clears throat> we have a number of tasks that we had initially proposed that involve refining models, characterizing uncertainties. I haven't talked about life cycle analysis. We want to ask where a lot of these new materials come from and whether there are secondary impacts that need to be of concern. Uh, what we'd like to try to do is try to reverse engineer our models and, and uh, come back with advice to the process developers for what kinds of parameters they ought to be seeking, and that, that will be a major focus of the work that's ahead. So with that, I will thank you, with apologies for running over, and take a question or two if there is one. So we have a couple of minutes for questions. Sally? Oh, there we go. Okay. Thanks. So you said high selectivity is important, but what's high? What, do you have a sense of what's high? What, you know, what would be a target that somebody should be shooting for? Uh, we, we didn't come with, with numbers. If we go back to some of the, <clears throat> some of the data that uh, we showed, it would depend on the particular material that we're, we're talking about. But, but the, the basic message is uh, we need to do a better job of uh, getting higher purities on, the, on, on these separations. So when we see 70% as a maximum for that particular uh, substance, those are basically substances that are reported in the literature. It's not what people are currently working on. Um, what you really want is 90 and, and 90. Uh, so w what that backs into in terms of the particular parameter, we'll figure that out, but that, that's, what we're, that's what we're looking for. Over to Paul. The, the effect of water vapor, I think, is going to be uh, a, an especially problematic one for, for a lot of these materials. And uh, uh, yes. Um, oh, so on your task list, one thing I didn't see on there, but you did kind of mention it during the talk, is sensitivity analysis. Yeah. And I encourage you, yeah, to keep yeah. on on the sensitivity <laughs> analysis. That might help with, maybe you don't build the best plant to begin with, but helps you later on when you get to the nth, you can start to do the 90%, something like that. Uh, our aspirations are uh, uh, <clears throat> to use the, the probabilistic capability that, that this model has and... and uh, do a more rigorous uh, uh, job, with, which will involve some expert elicitation. So I'm expecting that we're going to try to visit uh, folks in the three groups to try to um, elicit their, s <clears throat> their best estimates as to what kinds of properties might be achievable. <clears throat> we can put some of those judgments into the models and, and get uh, probabilistic uh, results, <clears throat> the likelihood of achieving different targets, which is <clears throat> which is a more rigorous way and, and, and would account for a lot of interactions of that. Ideally, we want to do that uh, both on the performance and on the cost side because at the end of the day, as you said, um, you want to get the best system to do a job and uh, we're going to try to figure out what those parameters are. Great. Thanks very much, Ed. Good. Thank you. Okay, the last of our uh, speakers is Turgut Edward Gurr. <clears throat> uh, Turgut is a consulting professor of material science and engineering here at Stanford uh, and executive director of Stanford's DOE EFRC Center on Nanostructuring for Energy Efficient Conversion. He served as the technical director of the NSF MRSEC Center for Materials Research uh, as the founding technical director for the Gabal Laboratory for Advanced Materials at Stanford. Turgut. Thank you, uh, uh, Chris. Uh, I will go for Edward. Why not? Just to keep the continuity. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, 
uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Sally Benson and Richard Sassoon to uh, that gives us the opportunity to share with you our, our research work. Um, let me uh, recognize my co-workers, uh, the people on the first row actually are the ones that did the work. Michael Stewart is a postdoc, he's among the audience here carrying the microphone. Um, he, he joined us about, uh, about uh, early this year. David Johnson is, um, uh, is a graduate student in mechanical engineering, he's also in the audience. And uh, I was, I'm pleased to say that, uh, that his poster got the uh, Honorable Mention Award last night, so you can see him as well as his poster out in the lobby. If you're interested, he's, he's mostly involved in the modeling aspect of the work that we are doing, so I'm pleased to, to hear that uh, we got mentioned. And Brandon Long is, a, uh, is also in the audience, sitting there in the back row. Uh, he's a, a graduate student in chemical engineering, uh, who just joined us about five, six months ago. And I also like to recognize, of course, my longtime colleague and collaborator, Professor Reggie Mitchell of Mechanical Engineering, who's actually the, uh, uh, the PI, the official PI on the project, and is sitting right there. So um, without further ado, um, let me say that our, our primary focus uh, is, uh, is uh, utilization and conversion of solid fuels uh, in fuel cells in a more efficient and environmentally friendly manner. And of course, uh, uh, this, pr uh, this uh, um, uh, presents uh, its own challenges, and I'll walk you some, through some, some uh, fuel cell concepts, how we will deal and handle solid fuels in a fuel cell environment, simply because a lot of the uh, conventional fuel cells uh, only handle uh, uh, gaseous fuels, and mostly hydrogen, and maybe uh, a few in, uh, based on, on, on methane and other things. But, but uh, solids, handling solids, or utilization of solids in a fuel cell environment poses its own challenges. And so I will, I will uh, uh, walk you through some of these concepts. And, and of course, conversion into, uh, into electricity directly in a, in, in a single reactor without actually burning them uh, provides major advantages. Uh, the ultimate goal, of course, is to go one step further uh, in this into complexity. And, and deal with and, and convert uh, coal, uh, which presents its own um, a set of challenges above and beyond simple carbon or carbon issues fuels like biomass does. So the, uh, the objective is to, uh, to convert a dirty fuel like coal into something uh, clean like electricity and hydrogen. And that's where the uh, GSEP project uh, comes in and makes it uh, possible for us to explore this particular uh, exciting avenue. So why do we care about coal? Coal is, um, is um, 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 oops, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. Uh, coal is, um, um, is widely used, uh, uh, it provides a lot of the energy uh, uh, globally and about 40% of all the electricity production around the world, partly because it's still a lot cheaper than even natural gas after the uh, 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 sh shale gas uh, uh, discoveries. And also, it's widely available and abundant uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in the Earth. U.S. has the largest coal reserves, more than a quarter of the, uh, of the world reserves. And most populous countries like China and India, uh, they have uh, large reserves of coal, and they are using this uh, uh, resource for their technological and economic development. In China, about 80% of the electricity is produced from coal. And in India, it's still uh, slightly lower, but still uh, very, very high. Uh, in the United States, um, uh, we're using less of coal, especially after conversion of a lot of the coal-fired plants to natural gas. But still, we're, we're averaging a little lower, lower than 40% of our electricity coming from coal in 2012. That's the latest that I could find from EIA reports which came down from about 45% uh, from, from two years uh, before that, but it's not expected to go much further than that. It's about 37, 38% over the long run in, in the next few decades. And we should, I mean, this trend is, is common to uh, around the world as well, as the world is going to use less in coal in sort of percentage of the share in electricity production. But that's not a very good criteria or the parameter to work on. Uh, I think we should look at the amount of coal that is actually being used, and the amount of coal is going to increase by 50% between now and um, uh, uh, 2040 or 2050 timeframe. 
So the amount of coal is, is, the, is, the, is, the, is what's going to uh, uh, be of concern to us. And you see in this graph, although uh, um, a lot of the renewables and natural gas derived uh, uh, power generation has uh, increased, it will be increasing or expected to increase over the years, but still coal will, be, will reign as the, as the uh, dominant force in electricity production. And thinking that, uh, considering that uh, most of the coal-fired plants around the world now operate at around, at the low 30% uh, 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 conversion efficiency, only the new ones uh, that are coming online are about a little over 35%, closer to 50%, depending upon the technology that they adapt. Uh, that's still a very low uh, conversion efficiency in terms of how we utilize it, but more importantly, as we've seen in the, in the previous talks, as well as in some talks in the, uh, uh, yesterday, that most of that CO2 that is produced is emitted as a small fraction of the flue stack gas composition. It's only about 10, 15 percent uh, of the flue stack is uh, CO2. Rest of it, or, or, or major part of it, part, portion of it, is, is nitrogen. And it's, we have all seen uh, the, from the previous talks how difficult it is to, to separate CO2, uh, energy intensive and, and costly that is in terms of separation. So there is a, there is a, a real incentive to, to think uh, differently about coal conversion. And of course, uh, uh, the fuel cells, what we call carbon fuel cells, provide a, a, a major opportunity in that direction. Efficiency is, of course, the key. If we can, say, increase the efficiency, um, optimistically, if we double it, then you can do the numbers, and, and it provides a, a huge incentive to a look into that direction. A carbon fuel cell, this is an idealistic uh, uh, depiction of a carbon fuel cell. What it is is a, uh, we have a, a bed of carbon or coal in the anode compartment. Uh, it's a, this is a fuel cell element. Uh, on the cathode side, we have air. We extract the uh, um, uh, oxygen from the air, oxidize it uh, to make oxide ions. We transport these oxide ions through an electrolyte. And these oxide ions uh, at the anode react with the carbon to form carbon dioxide, releasing their electrons. And those electrons uh, travel through the external circuit uh, to, uh, to produce electricity. And the only reaction product, as you see, is CO2. So uh, this electrolyte could be a ceramic electrolyte. It can be a, a molten carbonate or molten hydroxide or even aqueous electrolyte. Nevertheless, the net reaction that we achieve is nothing different from burning it. Uh, it's carbon plus oxygen going to CO2. Uh, but we do this by extracting electrical work out of that system uh, while they're doing this conversion. And the driving force for this reaction is about a volt. So we get about a volt of open circuit voltage in the, uh, in the fuel cell, which is pretty good. The uh, thermodynamic efficiency, theoretical thermodynamic efficiency, uh, uh, defined by delta G over delta H, where during this reaction, the entropy loss is so small that the theoretical uh, efficiency of, of this conversion is 100%. So what we are gaining is a very, very high ceiling for, for efficiency. Of course, we will have cell losses, the risk of losses, activation losses, and what have you. But, but the ceiling that we're starting out from is very, very high. So, Proportionately, we produce less amount of CO2, but not only that, we produce CO2 as a, as a primary component of our, of our fuel cell. Uh, so we don't have to separate it. Uh, you don't have to go through a post-separation process. You've just seen the big real estate and a process plant for capturing uh, CO2 from a coal fire plant. Also, Sally showed that same uh, uh, picture from Saskatchewan plant. It's a huge investment and a huge cost to do to separate CO2. And also uh, bear in mind that you don't see any water involved in, 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 this, in this process. So water is also is a very uh, precious commodity and, and a resource. Uh, just to give you a benchmark, about 40% of fresh water withdrawals in this country uh, is for thermoelectric power generation. So thermoelectric electricity generation uses a lot of water. So there's a large incentive not to get water involved in it. And of course, there's no moving parts here. Uh, it operates at constant temperature. It's fuel flexible. Lots of solid fuels that we can, we can use here. And modularity, of course, gives us an opportunity to do this in a distributed manner. 
But of course, there's a caveat. There are constraints, and major constraints. That's why this is so difficult. One of the major constraints is that we all know electrochemical uh, reactions or charge transfer reaction occurs on discrete sites at the interface. And that interface is usually between the electrode and the electrolyte. And these are atomistic or atomic scale uh, sites that these reactions will, will occur because it has to collect all the participating species that reside in different phases at that interface onto that reaction site. And that's where the problem is because you got a, a boulder of a, a carbon particle which has uh, sizes anywhere from say 50 to uh, 50 microns to 2 millimeters in size to be able to uh, make a contact at, uh, at atomic scale contact at an, uh, at an uh, electrode uh, uh, site to, to make this electrochemical reaction happen. So one of the techniques is to, uh, uh, to, to overcome part of this problem is to gasify solid fuel, either using uh, steam uh, for steam gasification, where we uh, 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 react with steam to form hydrogen and, and, and CO, which is steam gas, and then oxidize this hydrogen and CO, which is uh, through the gas diffusion gets into the electrochemical reaction site at that interface and oxidize. But we are chose to use uh, CO2 as a dry gasification uh, 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 method. CO2 is our anode reaction product, so what we do is, is in a way recycle that reaction product back to our um, um, uh, uh, system, and the CO is oxidized at the electrochemical interface. So that's what uh, happens. Uh, the CO uh, that is formed here is oxidized by the oxygen that's coming through. We have a ceramic electrolyte uh, it stabilized zirconia, which is commonly used in solid oxide fuel cells, and it transports oxide ions through the vacancy uh, mechanism. Uh, the vacancies are formed by uh, extrinsic doping to, to maintain charge neutrality in the, in, the, uh, in the oxide. So oxygen transports uh, through the, uh, through the uh, ceramic material uh, only in the form of, of an uh, ion, right? not in the form of an atom or a uh, molecule. Then uh, this uh, CO2 uh, can react with a nearby carbon in the bed and forming more CO uh, that feeds into the, uh, the anodic reaction. So uh, this shuttle mechanism, if you like, is, is self-feeding and, and uh, provides uh, higher kinetics than, than would normally do. Um, the end of the day, uh, what we, again, is uh, this carbon plus oxygen going to CO, go in CO2. Uh, we generate four electrons through the external circuit for every carbon atom that is consumed in the coal bed or in the carbon bed. And we tried many different, uh, we demonstrated this uh, concept, it's a fundamentally sound concept with many different uh, uh, solid fuels. This is uh, for carbon. Uh, we got about uh, close to uh, 220 or, or 30 uh, milliwatts per square centimeter. We did this with various kinds of, of uh, biomass. Uh, this is, uh, these are uh, rice and, and corn stover and, and almond shells and wood and so on and so forth. Uh, we also tried it with, uh, with uh, actual coal, the coal char, uh, which gives us uh, a lot better performance than all the others at about 450 milliwatts per square centimeter. I think this is still uh, is the highest uh, uh, performance uh, based on coal usage in a carbon fuel cell. Now, let me build upon this, uh, this concept. Um, using the same platform, if we just replace the air side or the, on the cathode with steam. So we have carbon on the anode side, we have steam on the, on the uh, uh, cathode side. The oxygen activity difference between the steam and the carbon is a downhill gradient. So it's higher over here than it's over here. So this provides a a thermodynamic driving force of about half a volt or slightly higher than that, depending upon the temperature and the uh, steam-hydrogen ratios. Uh, this provides a, uh, a, a driving force downhill for the oxygens to be stripped from the steam, transported through the electrolyte, and be oxidized at the, uh, at the um, um, uh, uh, anode side. And so we're turning a electrolyzer, uh, steam electrolysis requires uh, anywhere from 0.9 volts to 1.3 volts, 1.23 volts at room temperature, depending upon the temperature regime. It's a very high barrier um, uh, uh, splitting process. We turn an electrolyzer, which requires electricity to do a chemistry, 
we turn that into a fuel cell which produces electricity as well as a, as a fuel. So what we're essentially doing is steam reforming in a fuel cell, but with the, uh, with the uh, carbon uh, stream and the hydrogen stream completely separated uh, from, from, from each other. So there is no mixing and, and you can use this hydrogen for, for fan fuel cells uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in applications. So we have a carbon, uh, uh, steam carbon cell that produces hydrogen electricity, but requires heat because of the endothermic reaction. We have an air carbon uh, system that produces electricity as well as heat. So the obvious thing is to merge these two together and form a, what we call an ester cell, a steam carbon air fuel cell. And that's where, again, the um, uh, uh, GSEF project comes in to make this uh, happen and, and uh, allow us to, the, the opportunity to explore this exciting uh, direction. So uh, what, what we accomplish here is nothing more than what is being going on in a, uh, a coal gasifier. You supply oxygen to burn part of the coal to uh, derive the energy or the heat to derive the uh, uh, gasification process. And we do, this, uh, we do this in the fuel cell, but achieving uh, electrical work at the same time. So the project program objectives and, and, uh, and tasks, uh, we have uh, multiple uh, 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 items on this. Uh, of course, we're do, do, doing cell modeling for predictive studies and, and uh, uh, David's uh, poster uh, yesterday and also still outside is, is uh, focused on this modeling work. If you're interested, you can talk to him. We're, of course, characterizing our solid fuels in terms of their reactivity for, for the Boudoir reaction. Uh, needless to say about the experimental studies, but the two most important parts of the, of the program are the uh, uh, sulfur abatement and uh, catalytic anode development. In the sulfur abatement, we have a two-pronged approach. We try to develop um, solid sorbents to bring down the sulfur activity to acceptable levels where the anode is going to operate without too much degradation. And of course, at the same time, we like to develop tolerant anodes that would take that uh, level of sulfur and be able to do the job uh, without uh, degradation. So the electrode development is, uh, is going to be an important part portion of this project. Normally, um, uh, nickel, uh, cermet, and, and other metal anodes are, are used in solid oxide fuel cells, but they are not, of course, acceptable in the presence of sulfur. So what we're looking at, perovskites, these uh, materials are, are uh, very versatile and gives us an opportunity to tune ionic and electronic transport properties as well as catalytic activity. And uh, they provide us also with the doping strategies on the A site and the B side, um, where um, you can have multiple dopings, if you like, uh, as long as you uh, maintain uh, or satisfy the Goldschmidt criteria to, uh, 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 to, to maintain the uh, uh, perovskite structure. But it provides a lot of uh, 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 flexibility in terms of tuning properties. And because of the versatility of this, this whole list of very interesting electronic, ionic, uh, and uh, dielectric and catalytic properties that these family of perovskites uh, uh, exhibit, and I won't go into, into but man many of them are, are actually uh, in, of industrial uh, interest and, and being used in the technology. So the two uh, uh, family of perovskites that we have identified so far are the titanate base and the vanadate base uh, uh, perovskites. They have not been really explored too much in the catalytic area. And there is some uh, uh, indication in the literature that these uh, perovskites would have some stability against, against sulfur contamination. They have good electronic conductivity. They have uh, reasonably matching um, uh, uh, thermal expansion coefficients. So we are hopeful that uh, uh, these will uh, be a, a step forward in that direction. We already started making and synthesizing these things uh, and, 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 and doping on the A side as well as on the B side. Uh, and characterizing them uh, with uh, XRD and XPS. I'm not going to go over all the details. And we started uh, uh, putting them into cells and making what we call MEAs, the, the membrane electrode assemblies. Here is the uh, yttria doped uh, strontium titanate porous layer. Here is the zirconia electrolyte membrane. Here is the lanthanum strontium manganite uh, cathode layer. 
that uh, we have been able to um, uh, produce. But we are we're still a ways away in terms of actual putting in a cell and actually um, uh, testing it in the presence of coal. So in the, in the sense of uh, the solid sorbent utilization, um, we have identified uh, some of the uh, sorbents that, that make sense from a cost point of view as well as from their efficacy point of view going through some uh, thermodynamic screening, both in the literature as well as ourselves. What we found is that, uh, yes, uh, you know, most of the alkali uh, oxides are effective uh, solid sorbents, but they, the, their utilization is only limited to a very thin skin around the, around the particle because of the diffusion limitations. So the obvious things that people have tried is to uh, disperse them on, uh, on, uh, on uh, inert supports uh, what we like to explore is something slightly different. We like to try to uh, disperse them on reactive or consumable supports, like carbon, for instance. In the same manner as, 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 the, as the fuel in our fuel cell, we like to load them onto carbon and, and get the uh, sulfur to levels roughly below 10 ppm or so that we think our, our, uh, our oxide-based anode materials will be stable too. So this is a, uh, uh, the SEM picture of a, uh, of a carbon fiber. Uh, we, we chose these uh, fibers so that we could identify and see um, uh, where we are in terms of their loading. It's easier to work with them rather than with powdered uh, carbon or coal. Uh, here is after the impregnation of, uh, of these fibers with the calcium oxide, calcium hydroxide using a, an ammonia uh, as a dispersion. And you can see both on the surface, these uh, red marks or red coloring is due to the calcium uh, from the uh, backscattered electron image. It, it, both on the surface as well as within the bulk, we have uh, a fair amount of penetration and impregnation of these into the materials. So lastly, um, um, just to summarize uh, the, uh, the modeling results, we have been able to um, uh, uh, it shows that this is a very viable uh, uh, approach to both electricity and hydrogen generation, and you can tune in your um, uh, hydrogen and electricity production demand uh, based on, uh, on, on, on the requirements and, and demand uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the market. And you can, you, do, you can do this in a very, very uh, efficient way. The primary efficiency that uh, we have calculated or ex uh, predicted uh, based on experimental values or experimental data is roughly about 78%, which is the primary efficiency of both conversion into hydrogen as well as into electricity. The electrolyzers, the alkaline electrolyzers for making hydrogen, they operate around 65 to 75%. So they are still efficient uh, and, and comparably efficient but if you uh, consider the, the round trip efficiency, the primary efficiency where they get their electricity from, if it's coal derived, it's about low 30%, which make the primary efficiency of that electrolyzer around 20% rather than 78%. So um, we are pretty excited about this project. Uh, we haven't made a lot of progress because it's a young one, but uh, we feel that uh, this is going to be a pathway to efficient uh, conversion of, of coal uh, into clean energy uh, of electricity and hydrogen. Uh, we get a, uh, a, we obtain a concentrated stream of CO2. Uh, no pulse separation is needed. Fuel flexibility and modularity from, especially from uh, distributed generation from local fuels uh, in, in, uh, in Africa or any other parts of the, uh, of the world where power, distributed power is badly needed. This could be a, a, a sort of a model system to, to develop along those directions, provided that, of course, we have, uh, we have overcome and, and solved a lot of the challenges. And there are many. The links to this is very, very long, uh, but they can be addressed by uh, 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 basic research. And some of the things that we are addressing in this, in this pro uh, program will provide uh, uh, insights into, into a few of these uh, uh, challenges mechanistic understanding of the conversion reactions, coal, effect of coal contaminants on the, uh, on the performance, as well as other things that we, uh, we will uh, try to address uh, in, during the project. And, and I'll leave you with this, uh, with this message uh, that um, the carbon fuel cells uh, are a viable way of, of uh, going into a transition 
to a low carbon power generation. And uh, we would like to thank the opportunity for, to be able to do this under GSEP support. So with that, I will conclude and take uh, questions. Thanks, Target. We have about four minutes for questions. Uh, thanks for that presentation, Target. It was very, very uh, nice and, and really interesting, the thermodynamics of carbon conversion. Electrochemically, have always been attractive, so it's very neat to see uh, this concept, uh, you know, really being worked on. Um, a couple thoughts occur. Um, certainly, electro-oxidation of CO is always has higher polarization of hydrogen. Same is true, I guess, in, in one view from combustion reactions, CO is always seems to be the last to the party. Uh, hopefully that, that piece of it can uh, be overcome somewhat. Um, the one, one question I guess to think about is uh, that I'm not quite sure is how you feed the fuel. It seems like it could be batch process. Uh, I'm not quite sure there. And, and the other piece, um, would be uh, related to the fact that, okay, yeah, sulfur is clearly important. Uh, it seems like there'll probably be some pre-fuel processing needed. Seems like there's roughly a quarter of the periodic table seems to be in a lump of coal. Um, so maybe there might be some pre-fuel processing as well. Your thoughts on that? Well, uh, let me first start with the CO. CO is, a, uh, is not a very uh, uh, widely used fuel for, for, for sol oxide fuel cells or for any, any other fuel cells. And Based on the uh, very s uh, small single cell studies, yes, uh, CO has a, has a high um, activation barrier versus uh, compared to hydrogen. But in, in big cells that we have measured um, uh, in, in, in sort of pro pr prototype cells, the hydrogen and the CO uh, performances in the same cell uh, came about 5 to 10 percent. Uh, CO is, is slightly lower than, than hydrogen. Because when you get into the large systems, you get the resistive losses that dominate more the, uh, the kinetics of it. In the, uh, in the sorbent area, um, we're hoping that in, 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 a, in, a, in a steam-rich environment, uh, hydrogen is a very, very powerful uh, gasifier. It reacts with many of the uh, elements that you uh, mentioned in the periodic table, forming arsine and phosphine, you know, chlorides, and so on and so forth. They're all volatile, so they diffuse and, 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 and land on the anode. In a, in a hydrogen poor environment with a carbon rich environment, we're hoping that the volatility and the, and the gasification of, these, uh, of some of these, uh, uh, you know, like arsine and phosphine, for instance, will be uh, uh, mitigated or, or diminished uh, to a certain extent. And that we will be able to capture some of that with the solid sorbent uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the reactor. Now, this is a tall order, of course, and we, won't, we don't know until we try it whether uh, how much or, or how much progress we will make in that direction. But that's the, that's the, uh, that's the thought. Okay, we have time for one more. Uh, essentially, this, you sort of covered the, uh, uh, the question a little bit, mentioning these other elements, arsine, et cetera. But um, I'm not sure the lack of hydrogen will solve the problem because in combustion of coal, uh, there are lots of these elements that appear in the normal combustion process in the exhaust. Uh, I'm familiar with catalytic sensors that are used in, in some of these processes for um, uh, CO measurement, and they actually have shown silane poisoning deep in the pores. So you'll have some issues with these kinds of elements. You know, the, half the periodic table is in coal, and I'm sure you're going to end up with lots of volatile silane uh, um, hydrides that might end up in your... In, in your, uh, You're absolutely country. right, and that's very likely that will happen, uh, with a slight caveat that the environment in our anode is a reducing environment, whereas in the, in the combustor, of course, it's more, more oxidizing. Uh, so I don't know whether that will make any difference in terms of the uh, gasification rates of these impurities into the gas phase to land on the, on the anode and elsewhere. We will have to see. But, but our for since, since the problem is so complex and so wide in terms of dealing with all the impurities in coal. Uh, we selected the, the major one, the sulfur, as being a primary uh, sort of attack point, if you like. And if we can solve the sulfur problem, then hopefully we will have some headway into uh, dealing with the other impurities in time. Great. Thanks very much, Turgut.